So as I said, I'm uh, Dr. Matt Finn, a Senior Lecturer in Human Geography. I'm really delighted to welcome our panel today. We have Nina Laurie, Professor of Human Geography at the University of St Andrews, who is an editor in Progress in Human Geography. We have Karen Anderson, Associate Professor in Remote Sensing, uh, also at the University of Exeter, but uh, at a, uh, in beautiful Penryn, um, we, who is um, uh, Associate Editor of Progress in Physical Geography. We have uh, Tarek Jazil, Professor in Human Geography at University College London, who is um, Editor of Environment and Planning D, Space Society and Space. Sadly, Professor George um, Mallinson um, is not at full health, um, is unable to join us today, um, and we're wishing him well and a, a really speedy recovery. In terms of the event itself, we've given quite an open brief to our panel to talk about the theme of progress in geography. Uh, it could be in relation to their own work, their editorial work for, for geography journals, um, and their engagement with thought about progress in human geography um, and physical geography and the social sciences or humanities and the sciences more broadly. So a real range that might be brought together through different, um, through different contributions. Each panelist will speak for about 10 to 15 minutes and we'll have some time for the panel to exchange uh, thoughts um, in conversation and then open the discussion to everyone on the call. I'm going to ask that people hold comments and questions on the chat while people are presenting and then we'll open, um, open that up. One of the things I feel conscious uh, of through uh, my own work um, where I've had a chance to think about progress um, and in bringing this event together is that we're bringing some together some quite different um, conversations uh, about progress. People mean different things by the word, it invokes different histories for people and bring, uh, people bring different imperatives um, to this discussion. And I'm hoping the, um, the presentations, the conversation and wider discussion will help us explore that diversity. And with that in mind, I'd like to, to invite us to adopt a posture of curiosity as we listen um, and in our questions and comments to try and understand and explore these differences. In my own thinking about progress, I'd like to acknowledge uh, my debt to work by those uh, on the panel. Um, for example, Tarek's 2016 paper um, between area and discipline, progress, knowledge production, and the geographies of geography. Um, and I've also been provoked by the work of um, Alex Standish and David Alcock's work on hopeful geographies, optimism in the big picture. And, and I imagine we'll get a really interesting conversation um, happening today um, between um, these different groups involved in geography and education and really hopefully that will be very um, really interesting and, and really productive. Um, so without further ado I'd like to um, uh, hand over to uh, Professor Nina Laurie for our um, first intervention. Thanks Nina. Thanks Matt and um, thanks everybody. Um, I just wanted to say that actually it's a real pleasure for me to be here um, in part because I've started working with Grace Healy um, who I got to know through the Royal Geographical Society and we have a joint project together um, trying to think about how resources that have been produced on El Nino in Peru can be used to tran transfer themselves into a co-produced um, output for secondary school teachers. And I say this because it's something I believe deeply in, but do with trepidation. Um, because one of the things I wanted to start this with is I'm going to talk mainly about um, the journal Progress in Human Geography. Um, and I've spoken to two of the other editors, Noel, who's a, the long term editor, and Clive Barnett, who, who has recently joined, who's also, I think, from Exeter. Um, to ask how they see uh, the term progress because in relation to the journal progress because i've done it that way and I, and, and what i'm going to do is share a dialogue the three of us have had about the journal and the use of the term because progress in human geography is sort of one of the top journals it's been around for a long time and it seems to frame um for what a lot of people think of as progress not least because they do a set of or we do a set of um commissioned editorials by thematics are seen to define the discipline and, and you'll, you'll hear about how that works in the other journals as well so i thought it was important to to focus on that and and to share with you how that that academic journal is changing but but for me and then at the end going to talk a little bit about my particular take as somebody who works at largely in development and each of the editors in progress and human geography will have a field of specialism that they get i i get 
a lot of stuff on development, anything on Latin America, anything on feminism, and any of the really nice environmental stuff that happens to uh, not be nabbed by Noel, which is, which is a bit annoying. Um, and sometimes I get some of the migration stuff that doesn't go to some of the other folks. So we, we have a specific remit. Um, but for me, as a development geographer, um, I've really come to see uh, progress in the discipline as being something that play, pays a lot more attention to co-production um, with both the subjects of and actors of research and, and development, but also with those audiences that we're seeking to engage with. So that's why I'm particularly excited to be in, in this session um, because of the new collaboration with, with Grace. And I say with trepidation, because the other preface is that I think a research group like this is so important because we've all suddenly been thrust into a completely different world. Um, it, uh, teachers and um, uh, university teachers alike in having to think about how we teach. And um, as a result, we've started a, a pedagogies research group at St Andrews so that we can reflect on that experience that we've had before we lose it and everybody is, is really scared about writing those experiences down because we all realize that we don't know the pedagogy's literature and I've been encouraging people to write blogs or to try to write academic articles and, and so I think this is a really really timely uh, intervention so anyway with that um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to paste into the chat so that you can see the conversation that, that we started. So I wrote to the other editors and said, um, you know, I'm going to, uh, I put my hand up for this because um, the others can't, uh, can't make it. And so I asked them what they think of progress is and Clive here in the chat, which you can read for yourself, um, <clears throat> has, I think, given a really interesting opening um, gambit and particularly the bullet point um, where he says that for him, the journal Progress in Human Geography is basically seen to reproduce a plenary understanding um, of what geography is as a, and all of its different subdisciplines. So like more than just a summary or a review and overview, but a sort of almost like a, a plenary has that um, cachet with it of, of being so-called authoritative. And we might want to question that. Um, then his other bullet point, I think, is really interesting that he said, if, if practice not by design, um, the journal progress and the use of the term progress reproduces a sense of ever expanding horizons. And I think that is uh, something we might want to talk about as, as being for good or bad. And um, the other thing uh, that I think is really interesting is his point about being an old fart basically and i'm in the old fart group with him although he uses a much better term than i have come drogonly um but one of the things i find as an editor as a journal and i find increasingly as i'm supervising phd students is a presentism of the nowism uh the fact that people don't write about anything or cite anything unless it's from 2016 onwards and maybe it's just that i'm getting old um but at so many things seem to have been said slightly differently in different ways before and yet the idea of progress tends to open up the idea that you just slag it off and critique it and move on and say the same thing often in different terms so you know i'm being quite open and honest here um so that's what um clive, Cl clive wrote and then and as i said you can read that in your own time and now i'm going to try to copy what Noel wrote. Okay, don't know why it's not letting me do that. Bear with me a second. I thought I was being so good not having to share a screen and do a PowerPoint. Okay, for some reason it's not letting me do that. So what I'll do I don't know why, I will read out what Noel says, if you can bear with me. Noel says, I agree with Clive. If you look back at early editions of Progress in Human Geography and then Progress in Human Geography from 1977, so we are talking about a long journal here, there was, I think, a belief that progress meant two things. One, as Clive says, a formal building on prior knowledge, progress as enlightenment and building blocks of knowledge, and a broad sense that this brought benefits to geography and perhaps a wider society. He calls that progress as improvement in one or other registers. 
Then he says, I agree with Clive, as the discipline has become larger, more diverse, and more critical in Burton Thomas, in tenor, progress is probably now a term we might use to endorse whatever contingent developments happen to have occurred. I think that's a really interesting phrase, whatever contingent developments happen to have occurred. It becomes emptied of meaning, or at least significantly more complicated in meaning than ever before. And I think this is a really personal, interestingly observation that he says next. And let's be honest, not too many would now use the term progress without a healthy dose of self-awareness. Even those advancing decolonial approaches, which seem self-evidently progressive, would be included here. And I suppose in addition, progress now is much too as something that can reside in the, it can't reside in the accumulation of knowledge per se, but as much in the contexts and ways in which discovery, application and impact occur. So I'm sorry that I had to rush through that. I'm still trying to type, uh, print in um, what I said. So that was Noel's take, okay? And I think that for me, it's really interesting because in the last bit, he talks about um, uh, impact. And one of the things I have worried about as a geographer is what I've put there in, in, in the text, which is so many of the papers that we get in progress in human geography are people trying to write out in neat for geography what comes from another social science. Okay, and I think that this has been a real issue in the past in, in geography. You know, the latest theory in sociology or in international relations or development stu studies gets reproduced in a slightly different language. You put spatiality in or you call it geographies of and then people say, oh, here we are. This is one of those contingent um, advances that uh, Noel was talking about. And um, I think this has been something in the past, particularly sort of in the early 90s, that was very much um, the vogue in, in, in all sorts of subdisciplines. Whereas now, I would say into, into this, this century, geography as a discipline seems to have more confidence in itself, and there is less of that. And I think, therefore, there's uh, what I talk about as a magpie approach. I think there's less of that in the discipline. And I think in part, this is also because this confidence is about the fact that there's much more confidence now in geography as a discipline, because it has already been professionalized. And if we think about, you know, initiatives like in the Royal Geographical Society for the professional uh, geography uh, for the ambassadors, but also to become a professional geographer. If you think about the uptake of geography from schools into university, you think about the profile that geography um, has been given also through the Royal Geographical Society to identify geographers working in government or in the most recent uh, the appointment of Will Hutton as the new president of uh, the Academy of Social Sciences. He counted geography in there as one of the important social sciences that's going to help us cope with the post pandemic. So I think this magpie-ness uh, of, of geography has changed and I think conceptually I like to think of us as Catholic in our approach. And I think for me, that comes from also having worked very closely uh, with physical geographers. The fact that um, we need to be Catholic because we need to understand how things work together in different ways and, and, and can dialogue within that, often from very different epistemological starting points. So um, in terms of uh, moving on from that comment there about I still want to make a difference. I'm, I'm in this job to make a difference and I'm a geographer to make a distant difference. But I recognise that not everybody has that position and for some people that is too normative. Um, but I was on the, um, for those of you who know about the research excellence framework, this, if you're not in universities, this um, basically does a review of the level of quality of research in universities every five or six years. And I was on the one in 2015, which was the first time they had to review um, impact case studies to show how geography research makes a difference in the world. And um, people were very, very skeptical about this as a neoliberal agenda. There was all sorts of problems with it. However, for me on the panel, and increasingly so now, what is very exciting is for me that put co-production on the agenda. And for me, as a development geographer, what is progress in geography is about the highlight that we're giving to things that are, are co-produced. Co and I do wonder whether 
with this sort of institutionalization that's been flagged by uh, Clive in relation to the journal, whether we would have been talking in those terms um, without the ref, we might not have been, or it might not have been legitimized in the same way. However, if you look at the um, development field and the academic publications, people talk about co-production, but there's very little that's co-authored. I see very little that's co-authored coming to Progress in Human Geography that's co-authored with organisations in the Global South, that's co-authored with uh, partners in the Global South, that's authored primarily by uh, academics in the Global South or authored in partnership. And while there is an increasing emphasis um, on decolonizing agendas and on research talking about decolonization, as somebody who works in Latin America, um, one of the things that really surprises me about that is how much of that is all written in English, all of the citations are in English. And for example, recently I was asked to review a paper that talked about decolonizing knowledge and used the example of an indigenous group as a starting point in North America, assumed that everybody knew who they were, assumed everybody knew where they were. Whereas coming from a context that I work in, um, you know, I had to say, you know, I don't know who this is. So there's sort of more sorts of hegemonies, I think, around English as a academic language that is opening up certain spaces for certain representations of how knowledge is co-produced. And sometimes I just want to get back to the nuts and bolts of it. And I think we need in journals and in research generally to do far more of explaining the nuts and bolts of how knowledge is produced and how it's co-produced and what languages are, uh, are used. And being on the REF panel on this research, on this panel that reviewed lots of um, research in geography, I became a real fan of the journal Nature. And I hadn't at this point worked with physical geographers. Because in, if you're not a physical geographer, uh, what is brilliant about nature is you get a four page summary of it and then you can click on this extra bit that gives you 12 pages of the methodologies. And as somebody who primarily works in qualitative research, so interviews, focus groups, maybe um, visual methodologies, we are really bad at talking about how we co-produce that knowledge or even how that knowledge is, is produced. And so I would love a journal that would have a click on as well for that level of detail for how access to communities is negotiated, how um, things are chosen to be analysed, what's chosen to be analysed. And just to finish, I want to give a, a, a real flag for something that I think is, has been a really good achievement, let's call it that rather than progress, in progress in human geography over the last year. And that is uh, three articles on qualitative methods um, that were produced by Russell Hitchens and Alan Latham from UCL. And what they have done is they've, they've done a review of published work using qualitative methods. And they've talked about how geographers have represented their methodologies and the pitfalls of that. And, and there's this really, really interesting engagement with interviews, with doing ethnographies, how vignettes are used, and basically how often we're not really very systematic about some of this. So um, that's my little tour through. Um, I hope there's enough uh, to, to get people chatting. I will try and see if I can post in uh, Noel's as well so you can see what became uh, before mine. Thanks. Thanks, Nina. That's fantastic. We'll head straight over to uh, Karen uh, Anderson. I'm going to switch over the spotlight here. Thanks, Karen. Thank you, uh, Matt. And thanks, Nina. That was really, really nice. Um, so hi, everybody. I'm uh, Dr. Karen Anderson. I'm an associate professor in remote sensing at, at the University of Exeter in the UK. Um, and I'm also an associate editor for a kind of uh, PED journal to the one Nina's just been talking about, which is Progress in Physical Geography. Um, and I'm a subject editor really for that journal. So uh, my editorial work there is really concerned with um, handling a range of papers. I would say I, I see some geospatial papers, but the vast majority of work that I see is kind of biogeography actually. Um, and uh, as a sort of environmental scientist by training, um, I'm happy in that space. That's stuff that I'm familiar with. Um, and I guess, you know, through my PhD in remote sensing, I've become also quite uh, familiar with uh, 
the physical aspects of, of those methodologies. So, um, so I look at papers that, that cover quite a, a broad church of physical geography in that regard. Um, some of the papers I would say probably, you know, on first glance, you might not consider them to be physical geography, but, um, but progress in physical geography covers a very large discipline actually, which I would say is probably more environmental science um, than just purely geography. Uh, but that's an interesting point for discussion maybe is where does geography start and everything else end. <laughs> um, I'm going to post in the chat uh, just to sort of match. Oh, it's not letting me paste either. Uh, I was going to paste the um, uh, the aims and scope of progress in physical geography for everybody in the audience, but it's not allowing me to paste either. So I, I won't do that. I can paste a link at the end to the page, which um, which gives that information so that you can have a read. But you'll see that it's quite broad and it really covers uh, a whole range of kind of interrelated fields across earth science, biological and ecological system sciences. So, um, yeah, I think that's quite an interesting uh, point in its own right, really, in terms, of, uh, in terms of what is geography and what is progress in geography. But I do actually um, have some slides that I want to share. So I'm going to share my screen. Um, oh, hang on. I think it's this one. Share. Okay, hopefully this is working. Can you see that? Okay. Yeah, thanks. Okay. We can see that. Great. So if I make that a slideshow, hopefully you can see that all right. Um, so I want to start really uh, by referencing a paper that was published in Progress in Physical Geography in 2020. Um, and it's this paper here by Carol Harden et al. Um, and these authors are all affiliated with the um, Association of American Geographers. And this paper is one of our most read or downloaded papers in the last six months. So it's been quite influential um, in our journal uh, in the last year or so. And the reason I want to kind of call on this to begin with is that it provides a really nice narrative, I think, that answers um, or provides an answer to the question that Matt has posed um, about physical geography and particularly why it matters. And they argue that physical geography makes a difference to people and contributes to environmental decision-making at various scales. And they say that the kind of multiplicity of subjects and approaches within the discipline of physical geography is really providing a solid foundation for understanding why physical geography matters. Because if we want to face the complexity of life and landscapes and their interactions, then as physical geographers, Harden et al say that we must ourselves be complex as geographers, which means that we must embrace the diversity in all areas of our research tools and our complement of researchers. So I think that speaks to, to actually what Nina was saying about co-production of knowledge as well. Um, so they argue that beyond serving social justice, we must increase participation in geography beyond the Western white dominance and they argue that uh, physical geography will benefit from approaches that span these natural science, social science and humanities disciplines. So they're kind of arguing for more interdisciplinarity within geography, which sort of sounds like uh, a slightly difficult argument to make because it's geography, right? It's one discipline, but actually I think geography as a discipline is really diverse and, and actually often the human and the physical sides don't speak to each other well enough. And that's what they say here. They say we need to redouble efforts to strengthen linkages with other branches of geography. And physical geographers need to stand shoulder to shoulder with human geographers to confront the challenges and opportunities that face us in the 21st century. And coming back to what Nina was saying about the REF, the Research Excellence Framework, they argue quite strongly for the fact that we need improved institutional support those collaborations to be uh, in order to sort of strengthen the, the capacity for researchers to do this human geography physical geography work together um, and I think that's a really nice place to start <laughs> um, uh, and, and it speaks to some of the things I'm going to present in the rest of this um, little slot that I've been given um, and uh, in particular, what I want to do is just shine a light on a few papers uh, that we've published in, in Progress in Physical Geography recently. 
um, but also sort of, sort of finished by reflecting on some work of my own, so fairly similar to, to what Nina has done. So if we look at the, um, uh, the most read papers in progress in physical geography over the last six months, we see all of those arguments that are, are made by Carol Harden et al, kind of playing out actually. Um, and uh, these are the papers that are, have, have been the most downloaded of, from our journal. All of these papers that you can see on the screen now are interdisciplinary pieces. Um, some fairly tightly within geography, you know, bringing different aspects of the geographical discipline to bear on a question, but some actually sort of reaching out beyond geography into health. Um, obviously, the first one there on the COVID-19 pandemic and so on um, reaches into um, uh, into healthcare geographies and and uh, and uh, epidemiology. Um, and so I think, you know, actually their paper is a very nice <laughs> introduction to, uh, to the diversity and the interdisciplinarity that we see in these popular papers pub published in, in PIPG. And actually I, I did um, similarly to Nina sort of delve into the backstory of, of the journal and I asked various people in the editorial office to provide me with some data actually and they sent me a massive spreadsheet of all the papers that have been published since 2002 and how many, how many times they've been cited and so on. And if, if you just filter those to look at, you know, I guess the most influential papers, the ones which are being cited the most since 2002, then we kind of see um, a few groupings emerging from those papers. I've just picked a few. Um, this is by no means everything, but it's kind of the top ones. There's certainly a very strong focus on dynamic systems. And some of these are review papers and some of them are new empirical work. Uh, we have a mixture of those papers in our journal. Um, the reviews all have to provide some kind of forward look in progress in physical geography. We can't simply just provide backwards looking reviews. We want to know opinion pieces. We want to, we want to see synthesis of material, but also uh, a future look um, on a particular discipline by experts. Um, and so we see these kind of three groups emerging here, dynamic systems, then kind of key concepts in geography, um, and then a very strong methods kind of focus in some of these highly cited papers as well. Um, and actually in the, in the methods part, there are quite a lot uh, of papers, two of which I've listed there, which are kind of in the field that I'm an expert in, which is remote sensing, which, which is a field that has advanced quite significantly since 2002. So perhaps that's why. Um, so moving on, um, I also kind of want to um, look at the more recent papers that uh, have been very heavily cited in the journal. And th this is again, just a screenshot from the website. Um, and these papers, uh, again, kind of speak to that interdisciplinary narrative within uh, within physical geography. There's a really strong flavour here actually in the most cited papers in the last few years being um, very strongly focused towards the Anthropocene and how we define it. Um, that's a big debate in physical geography and in earth system science generally. Um, but I want to kind of shine a light on the one that I've highlighted here by Taroli et al which is a paper that integrates geophysical and archaeological approaches to interpret a broad range of anthropogenic geomorphic features. And they use structure and function as a way of trying to um, generate socio-cultural fingerprints. So I liked this one and I picked it as, a, as something to highlight here uh, in terms of progress in geography because I, I like the way that this kind of actually begins to cross those boundaries from, from kind of very physical methods, particularly they use a lot of remote sensing data to do their work here, um, into kind of more cultural um, uh, applications and archaeological applications as well of those data. So, um, so yeah, they argue basically that uh, physical geography needs to advance towards these empirical and theoretical frameworks that integrate nat natural, social and cultural forces, which are now the main shapers of earth surface processes. And so these kind of figures in their, in their paper, which are very familiar to me, this kind of geospatial data sets are being used in the context of trying to 
um, identify these socio-cultural fingerprints across the land surface. And they demonstrate both how they can be measured, but then also how the long-term dynamics of these anthropogenic landscapes can be more appropriately investigated with these sort of state-of-the-art methods. And the reason I liked this paper and I wanted to kind of show it to you is that I think it's sort of, um, when we think about sort of methods in physical geography, we can often, particularly in remote sensing and so on, get very um, tied up with inventing new algorithms, coming up with new machine learning tools and, um, uh, you know, deriving new statistical relationships, which can be very kind of, you know, technologically and computationally expensive to do and those things are all very interesting from a sort of disciplinary point of view but actually um, what this paper does is it takes these relatively straightforward and now quite mature remote sensing techniques which in themselves are not really state-of-the-art methods I would say in in remote sensing but they are solid and mature and they work we know they work from years and years of work um, things like land cover classification, things like change detection from elevation models, basic qualitative methods actually like hill shading elevation models, which is what you can see in the middle panel of this slide here. It's just kind of a way of visualizing data. So it's, it's not quantitatively extracting values out of the data set, but just looking at data and being able to interpret it. Um, and so the innovation in this paper is not in applying those methods, it's actually in using those data to, um, uh, uh, to, to answer new questions and to bring those data to new audiences. And I think that is really nice work, um, but I don't know whether it sort of responds to Clive's, uh, uh, Clive's point about sort of reinventing geographies for, for new audiences or bringing um, techniques from other places into a sort of geographical frame. So that's maybe something we can discuss. I think the thing that this shows me is that there's still loads of, sort of discoveries to be made and there's loads of data that we can exploit in different ways. And I think that, um, you know, actually data is not necessarily the problem. It's actually sort of trying to answer these big um, questions which are relevant and urgent for society at the moment that we need to, um, we need to think about. And so kind of to, to close, I just wanted to show you a couple of things from my own work, really, that I think evidence um, areas where progress is really happening. Um, and one of those is in cloud based computing and uh, in, particularly in using free to use data sets, uh, remote sensing data sets from satellites pr predominantly on the cloud. And actually doing some fairly basic processing, but the innovation here and the progress here is really in extrapolating uh, observations over much larger and potentially up to global kind of scales. So I'm sure you've all used Google Earth and you know what it is. Google Earth Engine is, is a sort of technological step beyond that. It provides users with access to data on the cloud. And it allows, um, it allows anybody in the world with a Gmail account and an internet connection to uh, access big data opportunities for processing um, satellite data. Now, formerly, this would have had to have been done by downloading, you know, maybe terabytes worth of satellite data to a local hard drive and then processing those data locally. And that's obviously out of reach of of people um, in many parts of the world, including in the UK. Okay, I'm not just talking about people in in uh, in, in countries where we, you know, there may not be access to high performance computing, but even PhD students and so on in in this country would would struggle to do the kinds of things that we can now do through an internet browser with this capability. It's only come along in the last couple of years. And you can just type code into the window and start to execute kind of planetary scale geospatial analyses. So the techniques are not new here. We're still applying sort of relatively robust remote sensing workflows, but we can suddenly make progress in answering big questions about the world by executing these workflows on the cloud and exploiting Google. Now there are questions about kind of data and power, I think, that lie behind that. And should we be giving our code to Google to do this as geographers. I, that's another point for debate. Um, and is it right that Google are the other kind of company behind uh, this capability? But 
Um, I'll reserve discussion of that and just show you a couple of things that we've done with Google. Um, this one uh, actually answers uh, Nina's point about um, co-production. So we had a project which was funded by Oxfam and we were working with a, a water uh, NGO based in Bolivia called Agua Sustentable. They were uh, a Bolivian a charity that work towards kind of sustainable water resources and through a PhD student Sally Rangecroft we did a piece of work with them where we actually mapped uh, a whole load of geomorphic features uh, across the Bolivian landscape using Google Earth um, and these were rock glaciers which contain ice but they're covered in a, in a rocky debris uh, and so uh, that's one example it's very very basic GIS this it's just look on Google Earth identify the feature map its distribution and work out how much water is in it based on some fairly simple statistics but these are water resources that Agua Sustentable didn't know existed before we did this work and they're in really hard to reach places that you can't map uh, on foot very easily because they lie in the high Andes. We also scaled this up to do the same across the whole of Nepal uh, with a, a PhD student called Darren Jones uh, there are many more rock glaciers in Nepal than there are in Bolivia. Um, I think there's about 100 in Bolivia and there's about 1,000 or so in Nepal and we mapped the distribution and calculated the water equivalents in those. So it adds to the water resources story by doing these very basic workflows. Finally, I just want to um, finish by kind of coming a bit closer to Earth. Uh, another piece of work that we've been doing for quite a few years is developing photogrammetry methods in geography and particularly photogrammetry from drones and uh, we equip our drones with cameras and we fly them over landscapes and we build volumetric models of, um, of those landscapes and we're particularly interested in describing the, the structure of vegetation in landscapes so that we can calculate how much carbon is stored within those plants. Um, so this is now quite a mature technique in physical geography. It's, it's really risen up through the ranks in the last decade because of computational power improvements. Um, and we can now build models like this of landscapes, which uh, look really cool, but also tell us a lot about the quantitative carbon content of ecosystems. Um, so this is, a real pro this is a real kind of bit of progress. It puts remote sensing in the hands of the geographer. Before, if you wanted to do this, you'd have to have a laser scanner on an aeroplane that might cost you millions of pounds to, to acquire data like this but now with a consumer drone and a camera any geographer can go into the field and generate these products with relative ease and actually at low cost and this has really revolutionized um, uh, remote sensing and we see a lot of papers coming into the journal on this topic the one thing though that really i think changes the face of science and, and physical geography science particularly with this technology is that there's a drone in pretty much every geography department in fact maybe if you're a school teacher you even have a drone in your school and so um, harnessing the power of those data by kind of crowdsourcing data across multiple groups according to a sort of fairly simple but robust protocol is something that hasn't yet kind of been done and we've tried to do that with a network of, of academics distributed across loads of universities um, and uh, we're trying, using those data, to, um, to describe the characteristics of plants in dry land systems globally. Um, and so this idea that actually uh, we can break free of, I guess, some of the, the previous kind of powers that <laughs> exist uh, over uh, our data collection, and we can actually go out as scientists and do the remote sensing data collection ourselves is a really amazing bit of progress, I think, and um, something I'd be happy to chat more about. And then finally, I was just going to say, I think it is our responsibility as physical geographers and scholars to kind of engage critically with these new methods as they emerge. And physical geographers have really sort of gone through a bit of a wild west moment with photogrammetry. There were loads of papers and there have been a huge upsurge in papers on this technique over the last few years and particularly geographers using drones for all kinds of things. But one of the things I'm really interested in is thinking about um, what that means for the discipline of geography. And so I joined up with a, a human geographer, Bradley Garrett, who is a vis uh, he does a lot of work with visual methods and photography and urban exploration and we spent two and a half years discussing this and trying to craft a paper 
Um, the reason I'm showing you this is because this paper was like Marmite for the reviewers. And um, we put it into the annals of the Association of American Geographers and it was rejected. And um, it was rejected on the basis that one reviewer criticised it for not mentioning uh, military drone geographies enough. And actually, we, we argue in this paper quite explicitly that these are different organisms and um, that we need to kind of consider the, the ethics and the practicalities and the opportunities of, of these research drones slightly differently from, from military geographies. Um, and so it was actually only because of a very sort of sympathetic um, editor at Transactions that we got this paper published and it's since become one of their most downloaded and cited papers since it was published in 2018. Um, and uh, I will say as a sort of reflection on that process of write, writing with a human geographer, I, I really am trained as an environmental scientist and I, and I realised I wasn't a geographer <laughs> until I wrote this paper and until I did the work and I, I feel like I've sort of been reborn as a geographer <laughs> having, having gone through that process because there were lots of things that equally we didn't understand about each other's work and there were loads of sort of wow moments that were really uh, exciting and actually you know I think um, adopting that posture of curiosity as Matt said at the beginning is a really good place to start having these conversations because there's really rich veins of stuff that can come out of of listening to other people and thinking about um, thinking about other other ways of looking at the same work and then finally I would just sort of point to some more feminist stuff that I've been doing with a group of scientists which is trying to sort of address the, um, the very male dominated nature of this side of the discipline as well. So I'll leave that there. And um, I've probably gone over time. So I want to hand over to Tariq. So thank you. I hope that's helpful. That's brilliant. Thanks so much, Karen. Um, I'm going to, uh, yeah, hand straight over to Professor Tariq Shazil and um, say, yeah, the floor, the floor is yours. Um, thanks very much, Matt, and um, and thanks, Matt, Steve, Grace, and Nicola for the invitation to to participate in in this discussion, and also thanks to to Nina and Karen for two really fascinating um, uh, talks, which I, I learned a lot from. I think I think you know some of what I'm going to say will resonate with stuff that you've said, and particularly I guess where I want to end up. Um, but I, th I think, you know, part of the reason that I've been asked to take part in this discussion is that, as, as Matt alluded to right at the beginning of this session, uh, back in 2016, um, Progress in Human Geography published an article that I wrote that in part interrogated the idea of progress in the discipline. Uh, and I want to talk a little bit about some of what I wrote in that article today. But I guess I also wanted to speak from my own perspective, also as an editor um, of, of another journal in the field, uh, Environment and Planning D, Society and Space, uh, and also having been an editor for five years off the journal Antipode prior to, to my EPD role. Um, and Karen, uh, let me just say that I think that many of us human geographers feel like inadequate geographers um uh, not not working with uh, physical geographers so <laughs> the feeling cuts both ways but um okay so so the article that i'm um referring to um as matt mentioned it's called between discipline and area progress knowledge production and the geographies of geography and its departure point really was to stress that as much as critical geographers are amongst those social scientists and humanities scholars who critically engage with the process and the phenomenon of globalization we're also part of and and indeed active participants in those processes of globalization and all the iniquities and uh, colonial continuities as well that, um, that we've subsequently developed sophisticated critiques of so in other words, as much as, as geography is a global discipline, it's also a discipline that is unevenly global. Um, and I think we'll all be aware that there's a, a quite a profound Anglophone squint in what many of us consider to be the vanguard of disciplinary geography. And that's a squint that, that maps onto a, a Euro-American hegemony as well. So it's fair to say that there's a, a concentration of power in the discipline, I think, that is both Anglophone and Euro-American. 
Um, and in the in that article, I, I'd made a few rough calculations um, at the time to try to give some weight to this to this kind of claim. Um, and because the article was published in progress, I, I calculated, for example, that in in 2013. 94.9% uh, .9 of published authors in that journal had Global North institutional affiliations. At the time I was um, editing Antipode, as I said, um, and I also I calculated that 92.7% of submissions to, to Antipode um, had lead authors with Global North institutional affiliations, right? And it scares me to think that those statistics are now eight years old, but I'd be really interested to see what they look like now. My sense is that they might be getting better, actually. Um, and incidentally, there's a really great paper by um, Martin Muller that I think is listed in the forthcoming section of Progress in Human Geography, which explores in more depth the linguistic and anglophone hegemony of disciplinary geography. Uh, so for anyone that's interested, um, they might want to take a look at that paper. Um, now, one of the points here, I think, is that disciplinary geographies, vanguard, or, or what in Anglo-American geography, at least, we conceive to be the vanguard um, and the discipline's progressive edge, it, it continues to, to exclude much of the world. And my paper went on to speculate on some of the structural reasons for this, uh, and importantly, also some of the effects of um, these structures, these structural reasons, these structural structures in which we're embedded. And by structures, I mean um, the global landscape of geographical knowledge production that bears the imprint of this unevenly globalizing geography. So the effects of this on the shape of the knowledge we produce as geographers. And, and for the purposes of this discussion here today, I guess I wanted to really adopt my journal editor's perspective on some of these issues as a way of, of kind of talking about how some of these global iniquities um, manifest in the knowledge production complex of our discipline. And, and I guess, you know, one of the things I have to come back to is the question that I continually ask myself as an editor, and this might sort of um, fly in the face a little bit of some of what Karen and and, um, and Nina have said, but the question I ask my I, I find myself having to ask myself when I'm handling papers as an editor is whether the paper I'm making a decision on moves the ball down the park, right? You know, does it make a substantive disciplinary contribution that would warrant its publication in our journal? And that, you know, in many ways, I feel I was thinking about this question, you know, what does what is progress? What does progress mean to me in the context of the discipline? And with my journal editor's hat on, I, I think that in many ways, this is the kind of way that the imperative of progress or some notion of progress touches down on my desk as, as an editor. Right. And, and I guess this is something akin to what um, Nina said Noel was talking about with regards to those contingent developments um, in, in the discipline. And I, I guess, uh, you know, maybe I want to be clearer here that the ball that we're thinking about here, the ball that we're trying to move down the park is invariably often conceptual in my experience, conceptual or political, and they're not the same things, of course. But I use the word conceptual carefully in the sense that I, I don't just mean that as a shorthand for theory work. I mean that some kind of development of the conceptual domains and debates in which we engage as geographers is required for submissions to be considered international world leading progressive innovative etc and it's you know it's, it was really that's why it's really interesting for me listening to karen just now and hearing about how um uh, and i think you're absolutely right that there is also this kind of you know papers don't necessarily need to reinvent the wheel to be really good and to be to be um, um, world leading as well. So it's worth saying that and I'll maybe come back to that. Um, but I think this this desire or this this um, imperative for papers to move the ball down the park is is inescapable. I think it's desirable for all kinds of reasons, actually. But I also think importantly that it's kind of embedded in the institutional landscape in which we work, um, but it has effects. And one of these effects that I sort of speculated on in the paper um, was that contextual 
place-based knowledge, accountability to communities and political issues and field sites on which we work can, can often all too easily slip away in the name of progress, right? They're not things that the academy um, easily holds us to account for. Um, so setting out these kinds of structural problems, I think, leads to a whole set of debates and conversations about what we can do about this. And one of the answers that I tried to develop in the article is around the what I, I tried to sort of set out as the alternative the, or the complementary set of imperatives that area studies can usefully pose for us as disciplinary geographers. So hence the injunction of the title uh, of the paper, which is to sort of dwell in that tense space, that tense tussle between discipline and area. Now, my own experience as someone who works in a geography department and who has always been a geographer, been trained as a geographer, but who at the same time has also always worked on South Asia and in South Asia, my own sense is that um, the kind of conceptual progress that my discipline mandates and also, you know, let's be honest, demands for kind of career progression, etc., is often very much at odds with the kinds of social, political, or cultural issues that affect my field spaces, research communities, so on and so forth. And worse still, sometimes the conceptual debates that our discipline um, demands can, if we're not careful, abstract us from the more grounded and immediate concerns germane to our field spaces and communities. Um, so it's for these kinds of reasons that I've found the imperatives of area studies, or in my case, South Asian and Sri Lankan studies, to be incredibly useful correctives, if you like, to the, to the kind of lure or the Elan, um, not the lure, the Elan, the teleology, I guess, of disciplinary progress. Now, connected to this, I guess, um, I, I think I've also thought a lot about how we as geographers might work to delineate what I refer to in that article and elsewhere as the, the geography of our problem spaces. Uh, and I use that term problem spaces from, take it from the anthropologist, David Scott, actually. Um, and what I mean by this, the work thinking about the geography of, of our problem spaces is, is really to try to determine where and to whom the questions we're working on make sense, right? So for whom are the problems you're tackling actually a problem um, uh, it becomes i think a useful thing to, to ask oneself as a geographer because this is actually a way i think of thinking about how we orient ourselves as researchers as writers um, how we orient ourselves to the different publics the different readerships different communities that we all inevitably straddle i think and we all do have different kind of um different different communities to whom we speak and are in conversation with. And I think that, that tackling this issue around problems, problem spaces, working out where they are for each of us as researchers, also um, makes demands of theory. Because if, if our problem spaces are located in the field sites and the communities with and on whom we're doing research, then theory needs to be strategic insofar as it enables you as a researcher to, to go toward some way towards solving those problems, right? So I, I guess what I'm saying here is that theory, in other words, must be answerable to the, to the so what question, which I think is also a, a really important kind of question um, that I continue to ask myself in my editorial pra practice as well. But, but, you know, with respect to this, this question about theory, I think there's a broader conversation about theory that we might open up here because I'm not always sure that geography as a discipline is that good at thinking hard about what makes a theoretical text theoretical as opposed to, to historical uh, or empirical or, 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 or narrative, for example. And in fact, I, I think we kind of, um, rather unquestioningly often make distinctions between theory and empirics or data uh, without thinking about actually what what distinguishes them right certainly in, in, in human geography actually uh, and what the implications of those taken for granted distinctions are um, and by implications I mean you know so for example 
it's all too easy for field sites in the global south to too often become simply sites for data collection rather than spaces that have their own histories of knowledge production, their own histories of theorization, problem solving, so on and so forth. So I, I think we need a conversation about how the discipline conceives of and, and also teaches theory uh, in inverted commas, which itself I hasten to add is not an anti-theoretical argument, right? It, it, this is not an argument against theory. This is a, 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 a plea to, for us to sort of think a little bit harder and open up a set of conversations about what we mean when we when we when we use that word theory right to what are we referring to what sets of conventions and histories with regards to knowledge production are we referring and then finally i guess the final point i want to make really is, is to say that i think it's worth reflecting on how some of this critical thinking around the notion of progress in geography um, might work its way into creative editorial practice in the discipline. And, and perhaps, you know, for me, one of the most obvious things to, to think about here and to talk about here <coughs> um, is, is about how our editorial collectives, our international advisory boards as well, these days I think need to be more diverse, um, less white, but less, also less Anglo-American in the first instance, and then less Euro-American uh, as well. And I've certainly noticed that I think, you know, since that article was published or since I started writing that article, um, so that was around 2013 or so, um, I've noticed that this is changing across many of the disciplines, major journals these days. Um, there's far more expertise from continental Europe Central and Southern America, Australasia and East Asia and editorial collectives that that I'm aware of. Um, and incidentally, I, I guess I just want to mention here some of the amazing work that um, the the Singapore Journal of Tropical Geography has done with respect to, to some of these debates over the last couple of decades. Uh, and that I think in large part is due to their location as well, right? Um, um, their, their geographical location as well. Uh, but, of course, there's still much more work to be done to create editorial boards, editorial collectives that ultimately open the range of geographical work that we publish. Um, and, and in this respect, and with respect to kind of creative editorial practices, one thing I also wanted to mention here was the tricky issue of translation and how Anglophone geography might facilitate more translational work or work in the space of translation. Uh, when I edited Antipode, we had a um, translation fund, which I think was a step in the right direction in terms of an attempt to bring non-Anglophone work into representation in the English language. And we used this fund to commission translations of some important um, uh, Brazilian geographical scholarship, for example. Um, uh, but these, these issues are complex, right? The issues around translation, um, uh, and, and translation practice in Anglo-American geography are, are, are complex because I think, you know, the other thing worth note, noting is that there simply isn't the resource to routinely translate work into English so it can then be submitted and peer reviewed, right? Um, and that's where the kind of the, the real sort of equalization in some senses would, would take place, uh, would, would start to take place. So, you know, I guess what I'm saying here, and Nina's already alluded, alluded to this, that, the, you know, the English language and not just the English language, but the conventions of writing an academic paper in the English language remains a huge sort of gatekeeping device. Um, very finally, I, I just wanted to plug some other initiatives that various journals are, are beginning to take. So, for example, I know that transactions um, of the Institute of uh, of British geographers are in the process of beginning a new series called Geography in the World, um, wherein geographers from non-Anglophone contexts are being commissioned to write um, the kind of state-of-the-art reports on geography in their own countries. I believe gender place culture might also used to have, have done something like that, like this. I'm not entirely sure whether they still do actually. But there are these kinds of initiatives um, cropping up and I think that the changing, I mean, this is what it is, what is happening, I think, with the sort of changing demographics and composition of editorial collectives and editorial advisory boards, um, that some of these initiatives are, are beginning to sort of uh, come to fruition. 
So I, I'm going to leave it here, but I, I said that I would kind of end in a place that I think both Karen and Nina have, have sort of talked about as well. And what I think I've been gesturing to in these comments is a way of thinking laterally, horizontally, less teleo teleologically about the notion of progress in our discipline, right? I, I do think it's a problematic term. I, I, I agree with Clive that, you know, it, it's, it's in some senses, it's sort of, it's just a word. It doesn't kind of mean anything. But in, on the other hand, it is, it is, you know, the title of the journal, this imperative to be progressive is um, uh, embedded in us and, and in, in the institutions in, and the structures in which we work. Um, but I think it's a problematic term in large part because of because of the term's history, right? And and that, that thus the kind of teleologies that are built into it, its connectedness with the colonial uh, project, etc. Um, so the challenge for me then, and I think this is exactly the same challenge that Karen and Nina have spoken about in different ways, is how to sort of reinvent the notion or re repurpose the notion of progress for what I would refer to as a, a decolonial disciplinary praxis going forward. So I'll, I'll, I'll finish now. Thanks. Thanks, Tarek. That's much appreciated. I'm going to bring um, everyone back in um, and uh, open up the, uh, the chat. I'm going to try to um, move back to um, gallery view. Um, so uh, feel free, um, everyone who's on the call, if you want to type in a question on the chat or to stick up a hand um, under the reactions button that hopefully you have available. Um, you should see a, a raise hand um, button, which you can do, and I'll try and bring you in. Um, as people are just composing thoughts or composing questions, um, Nina, do you want to put the question that you've put into the chat um, to Karen? And we'll, yeah. we'll start the conversation from there. Yeah, thanks, uh, Matt. Yeah, I was just struck, Karen, one of the things I forgot to say was about the multiple edit, uh, authorship that you see far more in physical geography than in human geography. And as someone now, working across both, it, it's quite a culture shock for some people. Um, so I was just wondering whether you think, well, the question is whether you think that makes English less of an impediment because you, you know, we now communicate, I communicate in Spanish with people who don't speak very much English and, and we also use Google Translate. So the actual team writing of things around the, the is maybe possibly a benefit, but also whether in some of the fields of physical geography, there are just less words. <laughs> yeah, that's a great question. And I, I think, um, uh, I think you're right that, I mean, this is really purely from a personal perspective that we work with, um, with groups all around the world in, in all kinds of different institutions. And we sort of have a policy with scientific papers, I think, that if someone has sort of materially contributed to the work, whether that be in helping to do some field work or in, you know, providing some insight to the way we might ask questions about something or, um, you know, in, in being involved in discussions about the work and shaping it from the outset, then they, they would be automatically included as co-authors unless they kind of said they didn't want to be and so I think we do have more diverse authorship in science generally I'm, I don't know if I want to say that, that it's a sort of specific geographical thing but I suppose physical geography is is science in many ways um, however you know coming back to what Tarek was saying about work in other places and I'm very conscious of, of that as a physical geographer. And I, I think, you know, um, recently I've been doing work in the Himalaya and we uh, were researching kind of ecological phenomena in the mountains. And, and I'm pretty sure that, that that must have been done by Chinese scholars and uh, Nepalese researchers and, and so on. And perhaps, writ, you know, it's not written up in English language journals, but there's a very high chance that it could possibly be already, you know, present in in other languages in, in different journals that we don't necessarily search when we go on Web of Science or we can't search because we don't sort of have the 
have the language skills to do that. Um, and so I think, <clears throat> you know, to be conscious of, of that and to try to think creatively of, of ways of sort of working with people in those places is, is, a, uh, is a, an important thing to do as geographers, because I think that particularly in physical geography, um, you know, there is a, de there is a, a, a definite sort of underlying current to make discoveries about things. And often those things are not in, in England, you know, they, they might be in the Himalaya, they might be in African countries, or, you know, we might be writing about geomorphic features in other places around the world. And I, I think in, in only accepting that the first discoveries are the ones that are written up in, in British language journals is um, problematic, really. So um, it's really good to kind of see you highlighting that, Tarek, because it's a difficult problem to, to solve. But I think one of the, if I can just jump in, I think one of the things that's interesting is Tarek's point about area studies. I have spent quite a bit of time, I mean, I now work with, with physical geographers, and I spent quite a bit of time trying to encourage physical geographers when I was at Newcastle and now here at St Andrews to join the Latin American studies groups, because they're, they're very old, particularly here, you know, area studies, Latin American mists. And the other scientists, particularly as we've had a global challenge research funding, so people have been working in areas and I've been trying to get them to come into the, the home of area studies to get, but, it, but it, it's a leap that's more difficult for them to make. They might want to like find one anthropologist, but they, they don't naturally see an affiliation with, their, with, with area studies. I'd like to bring Tarek in because uh, I, I understand you have a question as well. Yes, um, sorry, um, Karen, it's another question for you. Um, <laughs> but I, I, I was fascinated by your talk and um, I think this may lead on from, from Nina's comment just now, but I, I was interested in some of the things that are going on in physical geography at the moment that are, you know, thinking a bit more critically about <clears throat> the histories of environmental science, the colonial histories of environmental science uh, and physical geography. So, and, you know, the kind of there's the the critical physical geography work that's been going on coming out from the likes of Rebecca Lave and so on but then also I was thinking you know in the British context more specifically um a, the AHRC and NERC um joint call recently for funding to fund projects on what they were referring to as the hidden histories of environmental science right so mm -hmm quite sort of an explicit funding call to try and uh, think about the histories of environmental science and, you know, where some of our received, uh, I guess, scientific models have come from and, and the sort of problematic histories of those. I'm just wondering about how that's being spoken about and, and received amongst environmental scientists. Um, yeah, so I, I'm aware of some of that. We've uh, we've been reading some of that within our research group uh, here at the university, and um, uh, and I think it's really interesting work. And uh, and I think you know actually um, scientists generally are really starting to to give critical thought to that, but they don't have um, very many kind of solutions to to it so um you know we can obviously recognize <clears throat> the way <clears throat> the way that things were done in the past and reflect on the sort of mistakes of the past but um i you know i guess with that sort of himalayan example that i just gave trying to think through how we <clears throat> engage with scholars who are working in those areas currently actually rather than sort of making a, a British discovery and dis and sort of claiming it as new is um, is very hard for uh, to kind of get get your head around methodologically um, and actually to even find who those researchers are or you know who might be working in those disciplines within the sort of host country is really difficult um and so i think you know i mean from my own perspective for example i, I have a, a, a 
PhD student who is um, from China and she's working on Himalayan work and she's using her language skills to try to explore Chinese literature to, to find out what's been done in those spaces. And, you know, we can make small steps to that. And I think there are, you know, there are, there is a keenness to do that, but how it's still early days, I think. And, and actually, I think engaging with scholars like you would be a really good way of maybe sort of making some, some progress in, <clears throat> in, that, um, in that area. Um, and, and that's where it sort of interdisciplinary studies really come, come to help us solve some of these difficult issues. So I don't know if that answers your question. But that's fascinating. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm looking and, and not seeing at the moment uh, other hands up or questions in the chat. Um, I'd love to bring people in if people would like to, to throw in a question uh, or make a comment. Um, uh, in the meantime, uh, I, will, I will exercise a, a kind of prerogative of, of asking a question myself to the panel if that's okay. Um, so one of the things I know that some, uh, some geography teachers are thinking about um, is a sense of whether the geography that we study leaves students feeling um, more pessimistic or more optimistic um, or more realistic. Um, and obviously with concerns around um, mental health, around some of the geographies focus on kind of grand challenges um, could leave us with grand anxieties. Um, and, and I just wondered um, how, how in your own practice as educators, how in relation to this question about progress, you're thinking through how we can grapple seriously um, with, with things like the, the, with colonial histories and presence, with um, things like the Anthropocene, with, with a whole range of different things that are being thought through, um, but, in a, uh, but, but in a way that thinks about the um, emotional or affective responses of, of different students who will have different things that they're bringing um, to those questions. Um, do you think that a focus on um, particularly kind of case studies, as, as might be very common in, in school geography, leads us to quite a kind of atomized picture that maybe means it's harder to stand back and see some kind of, sometimes the bigger pictures? So I'll, I'll throw that out as a, as a question for, for the panel. Um, I can kick off on that. Um, I think, so just picking up on the case study, I think it's about the relationships um, and the relationship around place. So we had this uh, maybe somewhat heated discussion recently um, about you know, fieldwork and overseas fieldwork and overseas fieldwork for um, our students and also talking about, you know, overseas fieldwork into schools. And um, and I know the Royal Geographical Society is, 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 is keen, you know, to, um, to raise this issue as well. And at St Andrews, we've never really done the sort of long haul um, undergraduate like like we used to at Newcastle okay and the, for, for various reasons mainly because a lot of our students are international so you know it's good that they learn about Scotland um, but my point was I had given uh, uh, my Peruvian colleagues actually had given a sem uh, uh, it was a uh, international exchange seminar organized by a student-led group one of our students called students for global health and so different case study projects from different parts of the world presented and the, the researchers here and there were involved in this, this online thing just for 10 minutes. And the students had asked for opportunities, um, you know, if the projects could say how they could make a difference, how, how largely they could volunteer. And I said, look, you know, my colleagues presented and I said, the last thing Peru needs right now is more, um, you know, Anglo-American students studying in St Andrews going to Peru to help and build things. Um, but actually what there is a real need for at the moment is for my colleagues to, who are early career colleagues, to practice their English. And um, so informally, about, and then this was shown to our students as I showed it to my students as an extra resource. And as a result of that, three students volunteered to do um, conversation classes over WhatsApp with some of our early career researchers in Peru. 
And what I was saying to my colleagues is, and what there were first years and second years, and we have a four year degree here. And what I was saying to my colleagues is that actually what I would really like to see is, you know, if we do a sustainable development textbook, which we're talking about doing, that yes, there would be a box case study around the El Nino work, but that those St Andrews students would also be engaging from year one in that particular area where we have long term collaborative research and also teaching exchanges and that yes by year four I would hope that my students have already then engaged with both the material but also some of them through language stuff through through you know exchange would also have the opportunity to travel so it, it was this sort of like the climate change driven agenda okay it, it is really important and the travel stuff is really important but but what I was saying for me it is it they the, the three students just loved it they said god i learned so much about peru and i learned so much about what they're doing and i didn't realize that when you said this about el nino that's that's how they got their data so it was quite informal it wasn't they weren't getting qualification for it or anything but for me it's about relationship building and that is part of what i mean about the co-production you know the co-production doesn't have to be for a, a, an academic output it's also about how i think i want to engage with, with with my students and part of that work that grace is involved in is is the the products for, you know that are being generated by the school kids there as part of oral histories and that so it gets a bit me it's a messy answer but but that for me it's about the relationships across distance around uh what we're doing and and, and case studies i think are useful for that because they are cases in point for a bigger point but they're part they're nested in something bigger can i i can just i can jump in um as well and uh, but the first thing to say is i think you know the looking at the the list of of participants here i know there are um educators in this call who would be really well positioned to speak to that question um as as well from from their perspectives and um i've learned a lot from kind of being involved a little bit involved with the decolonizing geography educators group as well about some of these um perspectives and techniques i just the other thing I, I wanted to say briefly was just to sort of just to mention a first year um field exercise that we do with our students um it's a it's a term one first year module called imaginatively titled entitled thinking geographically one <laughs> and um in the very second week um of their first term at ucl we give the students a, a kind of a lecture on the history of geography, including its its sort of X-rated history in in the context of colonialism, imperialism, so on and so forth. But we do that via a um, a, a one day field visit to the Royal Geographical Society, um, and you know we 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 run a few workshops there with them, and we give this lecture using Felix Felix Driver's fantastic book Geography Militant. Uh, we deliver this lecture on the kind of murky history of the discipline and one of the aims of that that um, exercise is actually to make them feel uncomfortable um right and it's so you know you were asking about the kind of these sort of grand anxieties or and also about the kind of aesthetics or the effective um realm here and i think you know one of the aims of that exercise is is to is to make them you know to get students to kind of feel the this sort of weight of 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 history upon them and the kind of you know the um the gaze of of many many dead white male explorers um looking down at them from the the oil paintings on the walls etc but at the same time to also get that you know characteristically warm welcome from Catherine Souch and the invitation to kind of really become part of the discipline going forward right um so i, I think you know I, I would say that in decolonial geographical education some discomfort is necessary actually karen do you want to come in and then um, i also got another question well yeah i mean i was just going to kind of give a, a completely different example really of of some of the teaching that we do here and how how it's changed in a, i think in a really positive way and i think optimistically uh, kind of viewing um, change in physical geography is that because these new cloud based remote sensing capabilities exist we can um, rather than focusing 
the teaching of these kind of new geospatial tools for students on um, you know relatively pedestrian kind of examples that revolve around lots of sort of number crunching on a local computer don't really deliver great satisfaction i think um, we can now teach our students some really kind of world-class geospatial workflows on things like google earth engine which for me i think has really transformed my ability to teach remote sensing actually to students uh, because at its core remote sensing is physics really it's measuring measuring light and so we do quite a lot of that at the beginning of the course but having the capability to kind of zoom out and actually particularly in these times to teach something quite technical which requires only an internet connection has really revolutionized you know i, I suppose the 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 way that they view the the capacities and the opportunities of that of that sort of science and of that technique for for the kind of geographies they can do and the, and for the sort of uh broadening their expectations of the types of questions they could answer um so i think that is a that is a positive thing and i i found that my teaching in particularly in the last year was really kind of brought to life with that um uh, and you know i could connect with students across very diverse sort of classroom settings um through the power of the, the cloud-based computing and they really got it in a way that you know doesn't normally carry so um yeah it's a slightly different reflection on your question but yeah thank you so much for your responses to that i, I want to make sure we've got time for for this last question which um is uh, in what ways might the discussion of progress change when we move scales from the level of the discipline to the individual would you you um would you use the term progress to describe how you have made progress uh, in your own understandings of geography over your careers? Um, so kind of a biographical uh, perspective, thanks. I, I can start with that and just, uh, I, I guess the direct answer is, is no, I feel more confused than ever, uh, <laughs> Steve. Um, but um, I, I guess, you know, slightly more reflectively, I think, you know, one of the things that, um, it's a really good question because one of the things that I think is really important to, I personally think is really important to this kind of opening um, and a kind of, um, you know, we're, we've all sort of talked about progress as a way of um, opening the discipline in some senses to other voices and whether it's via the co-production of, of, of knowledge or via being more accountable to uh, field communities, so on and so forth. I think one of the effects of that, and one of the necessities of doing that is becoming more uncertain um, about what we think we know, or what we think we knew. And I think this is a point that I've, I address either in that paper or somewhere else, but you know, this, this, the importance of a certain amount of uncertainty and unlearning in the way that we learn, right? um so so you know part of the the what happens when we open ourselves to incommensurable differences to radical differences is that they undo our expectations and what we what, you know what we think we took we used to take for granted right so 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 becoming a little bit less possessive and protective of all those things that we we think we have um expertise and and professionalized ourselves in i think is really important um edward said used to write really beautifully on on exile and this kind of notion of not belonging um, um as a as a way of kind of sort of disidentifying with the conventions of tradition in order to to, to be more progressive in some senses and i think that's a really important um way of thinking about progress in this slightly different way that we've we've all been talking about I'll jump in there because mine follows on exactly from that with, with a sort of a very, with a personal story that is an illustration of, of what Tarika said. Um, so I've been, a, I would, would be known as a gender and development person, largely a Latin Americanist, but I've done a lot on gender and development as a feminist geographer. And I was starting to get to the point where 
I just felt I'm just speaking to people like me all the time who speak exactly the same language, read the same papers. And um, then we got a project uh, working with, with sociology colleagues in Nepal on trafficking. So, you know, my contribution was, was the gender and development side. And I honestly thought, oh, this would be great. I'll go and hang out in Nepal. I'll get under the culture of the place. And, you know, maybe I'll stay for a year and, you know, Kathmandu will be like Cusco. I mean, what was I even thinking? Um, it was nothing like Cusco. And suddenly all these things that I thought I knew, you know, because in, in, in Peru, I, I speak Spanish, but I don't speak Quechua. I don't speak Aymara. And, and what Tariq has said, I had to get out of my comfort zone of thinking what I thought I knew to really start reflecting on what I knew nothing about. And by this time, you know, I'm, I'm 57 now, but this was like 12 years ago. And it fundamentally shifted me. And because um, it made me realize I had become smug about my area studies context. And then related to that, I went to Peru and with some of my oldest friends who were just looking at this um, glacier uh, that Isaias knew like since he grew up. And even I recognized that it, it was smaller. And I lent my binoculars to a woman who was walking past with, with, with her, her lambs and stuff, and she had her kids. And she picked up my binoculars and she said in Quechua to, to, to Isaias, look how big it is. And I suddenly thought, you know, we all talk about receding glaciers. You know, these are the tropical glaciers that are receding. And she, with, in, in Quechua, looked through these binoculars for the first time and saw them as big. Now, she's somebody who could tell you a story about, you know, how the water's changing, but it, it, was, it was like a Damascus Road Eureka moment for me because I decided then I need to get out of my comfort zone big time and start working with physical geography and having never done that. And so I feel progress is that I've regressed to being what I think people at school think geography is, which is the combination of physical and human geography. And I've been doing that now for about six years. And I, I wouldn't call it progress, but it was definitely a per personal journey and it wouldn't have happened without uh, having to realize how smug I was becoming, to be honest. Thanks, Nina, Karen. That's a really nice story, Nina. Um, yeah, I mean, I think in answer to the question, I, I never really considered the word progress to be problematic <laughs> until today. And, and, you know, actually listening to uh, what Nina and Tarek have said, I, I would think more carefully about, about using it, I think. Um, but, you know, I mean, I, I, I completely uh, follow what Nina said and, and that sort of little experiment that I did with a cultural geographer really taught me that, um, uh, you know, I, was, I, I did my PhD in a geography department, but it was, it was physics. It wasn't what somebody looking into geography might consider to be geography and um and actually despite the fact that you know I, I work in a very kind of close geography department we don't have a, a divide between physical and human geographers we're all good friends we listen to each other's seminars you know it's quite inclusive in that regard until I sort of personally delved into a whole new universe of philosophy and, um, and and the work of other human geographers. I really had no idea about that side of the discipline. So, um, yeah, I mean, I think it's it, what I said before is true that I think in writing that and doing that, that's when I really felt that I became a geographer. The thing I would say, though, and I, I forgot to say this when I was talking, is that that paper um, that we wrote about drones together, um, divided the reviewers and it has also sort of divided people in the department because the way that we review papers for submission to things like the ref is very divided so as a physical geographer my work gets submitted to a physical geography panel and they didn't know what the hell to do with that paper they were just like we we can't give it a grade because we don't get it <laughs> and it's sort of ungradable and therefore it didn't go forward to the ref because it was never sort of put in front of um, the right person um, because I was sort of classified as a physical geographer. And, and so I think that's where we do, you know, coming back to that paper that I talked about at the beginning that we need to sort of find new ways of working together. I think that still exists. Geography is really quite divided still and actually as a discipline for it to 
move forward and address some of these issues, you know, particularly that Tarek and uh, Nina were talking about with the sort of um, decolonializing uh, our practices and um, thinking critically about what we do, then we've got to work together because I really don't think sort of science in and of itself has the answers to those things, but cultural studies and, you know, folks who study ethics and uh, history will have the answers. <laughs> so, um, yeah, it doesn't really answer the question, but I'm definitely going to be more careful about using progress in future. Well, I want to say a huge thank you um, to the panel. Uh, to Nina Laurie, to Karen Anderson, to Tarek Chazil. Um, I want to note a, a couple of comments. Uh, I'm really mindful of time, but I just want to include those um, before we finish. Um, uh, someone who's a teacher notes, they really appreciate the point about the idea that in decolonial geography education, some discomfort is necessary. I'm a geography teacher at secondary school, also identifies British Indian. Some of my experiences of geography education whilst I was a secondary school student were uncomfortable. And one can perhaps argue that discomfort has always been present, um, just an observation. And also uh, another comment, I along with Tarek have sensed um, the allure in some academic publications of abstract theorising over pen paying attention to the imperative of global challenges. I also wonder if there's a need for more attention to be paid to long-term global um, changes in say quality of life metrics. My question is whether there's a need for more evaluation of big picture and long-term trends for humanity and the environment. Um, in a link to Matt Finn's point, might some of these provide scope for hope uh, for students at FE in school? Um, I know there won't be time to, to answer this now, um, but, but thanks everyone for the event. So I just wanted to make sure I'd included um, those, those comments um, and say thank you so much to the panel. Thank you for everyone for coming. Um, we'll um, end there and uh, have a very good evening. Thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, that's great. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.